Absolutely beautiful. How many love to hear those two sing? I know I do. Thank you guys for using your gifts for God's glory. And, um, and if, if you like that song, uh, that's uh, off of Bethel's album that came out not too long ago, um, Bethel Worship Music. And uh, I just encourage you guys, you know, make it a, a part of your daily routine to listen to music and listen to worship music um, throughout your, your week. It, it'll truly make a difference in your attitude throughout the day and just your demeanor and and ultimately your, your life. Um, I, I believe that God inhabits the praises of his people. And even if that's a recording being spun on a CD or on Spotify or whatever, God, God will inhabit your car as you drive and you listen, or your home or your, your desk uh, workspace at, at work. So um, that's my two cents. But I am glad to be here tonight. And Sunday nights are oftentimes uh, my most favorite service of the week. It's, it's often more time to linger around and pray and worship, so I'm going to try to keep things um, a little bit sh- on the shorter side for two reasons. The first is so that we can do just that, where we can end with some time worshiping and praying and, and just listening to God, uh, where we're just not in a hurry and, and, and we can hear what God uh, wants to speak to us tonight. And the second reason why I want to keep it short is because before service, Pastor Hawkins told me that the chili he ate is starting to work through him. And, and so he said, uh, don't be too much like your dad tonight. Uh, keep things short. Be like me. And I'm just teasing. He didn't, he, did, he didn't say that. That was a complete lie and probably inappropriate for me to joke from the pulpit. But I am my father's son, and that's what you get tonight. <laughs> so... I did hear uh, that my wife did not win, so I also heard that Pastor Hawkins was a judge. Um, So we'll just have to have a a little heart-to-heart tomorrow at staff meeting and make sure next next year her quinoa, black bean, uh, non-meat filled chili, (laughs) if you can call it chili, will win. Um, But it is very good, and I'm I'm a huge fan of meat. But how many went to the chili cook-off tonight? How many enjoyed that? Pastor Courtney, thank you so much for doing that. What a wonderful idea. Thank you for everybody who put together a pot of chili. And um, man, I, I, uh, I'm just looking forward to next year. And I called dibs on not preaching because I didn't eat any chili knowing that I would have to preach. And so um, next year I get the, the night off on the chili cookout. So uh, tonight the title of my message is, Do You Really Believe That? Turn to your neighbor and say, do you really believe that? Now, my, my guess is that a lot of you have had someone challenge your faith asking this question or a similar question. Maybe it was, do you really believe that the Bible is real? Do you really believe all that end time stuff? Do you really believe that, that people are going to be caught up out of the grave? Do you uh, really believe that the Bible is real? How many have ever had a, that posed as a, a question as, almost um, insulting to our our faith. But I have two purposes in sharing this message. The first purpose is to give you a couple fulfilled prophecies that seemed so far-fetched that nobody would ever believe them to come true. And, and, And knowing and looking back at these fulfilled prophecies, it will give us faith that the unfulfilled prophecies of the Bible, even though they might sound crazy, they will in fact come true because you can bet your bottom dollar on God's word that God's promises are true and they will be fulfilled. So the first part of my message is to equip you to be able to answer the question, do you really believe that? And the prophecies tonight that I'm going to share with you are ones that are specifically um, that you can verify with Uh, facts outside of the Bible. Because if you are talking with an individual who is questioning whether or not the Bible is real, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to use the Bible uh, to prove itself. You have to start with some somewhere and, and, um, and have these outside sources that very much verify and bring um, the validity to the Bible. The second purpose is to bring awareness to the fact um, that the way we parent and the way that we were parented have a direct effect on the way we view biblical prophecies. Specifically, it affects the way we view and we think about end times. So two purposes. The first is to equip you, and the second is to challenge you. Before we jump in, let's take a moment and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you 
for the opportunity just to, to gather here tonight. I pray that you would speak through me that um, these, these facts, God, that you've left um, just this track record of accuracy, God, I pray that they would um, be absorbed into our minds and that your Holy Spirit would quicken them when we're in conversations, Lord, not so that we can beat someone up with them, but, but so that maybe someone's eyes would be opened and the blinders would be pulled off, God. And we pray uh, tonight as, as uh, we're just challenged by your Spirit, just speak to us whatever we need to hear, God, and we believe you're going to do great things tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said... Amen. I like that amen in the back. The first prophecy that I want to take a look at is found in Nahum. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll have to look up exactly where Nahum falls in the Bible. I knew it was one of the minor prophets, but I didn't know exactly where it was. So my Bible, it's page 1208. Not that that helps you at all, um, unless you have my Bible. Um, The book of Nahum was written between 630 and 620 BC, and a major theme of the book was the city of Nineveh's destruction. So we'll start reading, you can follow along on the screens or in your Bibles. Chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be, co- or they will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine, and they will be consumed like dry stubble. Then you jump, um, uh, or verse 10, excuse me, predicts that Nineveh will be overcome while drunk on wine. Again, in chapter 3, verse 11, he predicts their drunkenness. You too will become drunk. You will be, go into hiding and seek refuge from the enemy. And then in verse, or chapter 3, verse 15, Nahum predicts that Nineveh would be destroyed by fire. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you down. They will devour you and swarm of locusts, multiply like grasshoppers, multiply like locusts. So sure enough, Nahum, uh, who was in in captivity, um, made this prediction. And sure enough, in 612 BC, Nineveh fell to the Babylonians. Now, according to the ancient historian Dodorius Siculus, and I'm not sure if I'm saying, what is it? Oh, I I thought I heard someone. (laughs) I'm hearing voices. Um, Dodoria Siculus, uh, and I quote this, this ancient historian, the, the Assyrian king gave much wine to his soldiers. Deserters told this to the enemy who attacked that night. So D- Dodorius's compiled works confirm that this Bible prophecy was in fact true, and it confirms this biblical account. Then in the 1800s, Archaeologists found a layer of ash covering the ruins of the city of Nineveh. According to the Encyclopedia, um, uh, um, excuse me. According to the Encyclopedia, Nineveh suffered a defeat from which it never recovered. Extensive traces of ash representing the sack of the city by Bab- Babylonians. After 612 BC, the city ceased to be important. Now, I think that's pretty neat stuff. One, that Nahum knew that they were going to be drunk when they were overtaken. And two, that fire would consume them. And now back in the 1800s, they find this significant layer of ash that Nineveh had been destroyed. How many think that's pretty neat? So we know that that prophecy um, uh, was and can be confirmed from outside sources rather than the Bible. Now turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 26, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with the prophecy against the city of Tyre. Let's read verses 1 through 14 of Ezekiel 26. In the, the eleventh year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, because Tyre has said of Jerusalem, aha, the gate to the nations is broken, and its doors have swung open to me. Now that she lies in ruins, I will prosper. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring many nations 
against you. Like the sea casting upon its waves, they will destroy the walls of Tyre and pull down her towers. I will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. Out, um, in, out in the sea, she will become a place to spread fish nets. For I have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. She will become plunder for the nations and her settlements on the mainland will be ravaged by the sword. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Verse 7. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. From the north I'm going to bring against Tyre Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings with horses and chariots and horsemen and great army. He will ravage your settlements on the mainland with the sword. He will set up siege works against you, build a ramp up to your walls, and raise his shields against you. He will direct the blows of his battering rams against your walls and demolish your towers with his weapons. His horses will be so many that they will cover you with dust. Your walls will tremble at the noise of war horses, wagons, and chariots. When he enters your gates, his men enter a city whose walls have been broken through. The hoofs of his horses will trample all your streets. He will kill your people with the sword and, he will, and, and your strong pillars will fall to the ground. They will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones, timber, and rubble into the sea. I will put an end to your noisy songs and the music of your harps will be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock and you will become a place to spread fishnets. You will never be rebuilt for I the Lord have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. Man, what you talk about like a a doomsday prophecy. How many are glad that they don't have that out on Urbandale or Johnston? That's, uh, That's some scary stuff. But there are several different prophecies in this passage and they have all been fulfilled and can be verified by historical evidence. Verse three that says that many nations will attack Tyre. In 586 BC, Tyre was attacked and conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Then later, in 333 and 332 BC, several more nations under the rule and reign of Alexander the Great came and attacked and wiped out Tyre. Again, neither of these facts of of these multiple nations under Alexander the Great and the King Nebuchadnezzar are disputed by scholars. Verse 7 through 11 specifically talks about King Nebuchadnezzar destroying the walls and the towers of Tyre. Now Josephus, in his work, um, Antiquities of the Jews, records the 13-year siege on Tyre. It's important to know that Tyre was, was kind of like two cities in one. Okay? Part of the city was found on the coast, uh, on the mainland. This district or area was also called Ushu. I think I'm saying that right. But the other half of the city was an island one kilometer off the coast. Some refer to the island as New Tyre and the coastal city as Old Tyre, but they were often referred to as being one city. Now Tyre was this major trading port and a lot of money and trade happened um, and it was a very important um, area and, and place of wealth. So you can understand when Alexander the Great comes through, he's wanting this property, this area, because so much money and trade is happening on the island and on this coastal city. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar came, he destroyed the old city, or Ushu, which was the portion of the city that was on the mainland. Now, one could argue because um, Ezekiel was in captivity by the Babylonians, um, that he already knew the plan of Nebuchadnezzar, which, you know, that's a valid argument. He may have overheard something, rumor may have gotten out, and he, he may have written this with the foreknowledge that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is coming and, you know, okay, I, I understand that. But the next part of the prophecy was without a doubt supernatural prophecy. Verse 12 says that they will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones and timber and rubble into the sea. Okay, are there any sophomores in high school in, in the house tonight? No, any, any juniors or seniors? Okay, a couple of juniors and seniors. Have you guys taken world history yet? Did you guys, anybody have Miss Fred at Urbandale? Is she still there? All right, sounds good. Um, okay, I remember reading about this story, and this was absolutely fascinating to me, and I wish I would have known the Bible, the biblical prophecy at this time. 
Um, but in 333 and 332, Alexander the Great came along during his great conquest, and the leftover Tyrians whom many lived on the island, would not surrender. In fact, the negotiators that Alexander the Great sent to the island to negotiate were killed and thrown off the walls of the island back into the ocean. Doesn't sound like friendly people, and they probably didn't want anything to do with Alexander the Great. Eventually, Alexander um, the Great decided to take the old city of Tyres, which was on the mainland. He took the ruins of that city, the rocks, the rubble, everything. And he built this giant causeway and, and he throws it all into the oceans and eventually he busted his way through this fortified city in the island uh, and, he, and he took over the island portion of the city. Now, that's pretty cool to think that Alexander the Great and his uh, conquest helped fulfill this prophecy. Who would ever think that a city like New York that someone would just tear down a city and spend an entire year dumping its rubble into the, the ocean, into the sea to get to this island. Okay? Verse 5 says, Out of the sea she will become a place to spread fish nets. Okay? To this day, many people fish this cove that was made, um, or this, this causeway that was made by Alexander the Great. And they record that many people after fishing would lay out and spread their nets on this causeway to dry them out before taking them home. Verses five and 12 says that Tyre's enemy will plunder their wealth. Now, Alexander the Great was so frustrated at this long negotiation process with the city of Tyre that he freed his, his army to go in and just ransack and, and just raid everything that those people had. So what an amazing prophecy and how incredible is it that nearly 300 years after it was predicted, it came to pass. And we don't have to use the Bible to know that it came to pass. We can look in even a public school's history book to know that it came to pass. I hope that in sharing these two prophecies, it did two things. First, it equipped you when you're asked the question, why do you believe the Bible is real? And the second thing I hope it did for you is was encourage you and build your faith and confidence in God's promises. We can have a hope that is secure based on God's track record of fulfilled promises. We can be sure that he is coming back for us one day. And when that trumpet sounds, um, because all of the other promises promises and prophecies have been fulfilled. You know, I know that this isn't necessarily, uh, this sermon doesn't necessarily have to do a lot with end times. However, when we look at end times, we need to understand and we need to have the confidence that when Jesus says he's coming back, he absolutely is coming back. And we can be certain of that. Jesus says um, that those who have this hope, what hope? the hope that Jesus Christ is, in fact, coming back. These, they're those that have this hope, purifies themselves as they wait. God has left this perfect track record of past prophecies so that we can have faith that even though we don't understand it, even though it sounds crazy, just like Tyre City sound, sounded crazy to be thrown in the ocean, to have it be a place for fishermen, even though that sounds crazy, and even though being caught up and, and raised from the dead sounds crazy, we can look back and believe that, yes, it sounds crazy, but so did this and this and this. These are just two prophecies of, of a ton in the Old Testament. And I would encourage you, you know, continue to, to dive in and, and understand why you really believe what you believe. But tonight, I don't want to just equip you and encourage you in your faith. I believe that we need to be challenged and changed. Okay, our culture is very much a different culture than the culture just 50 years ago. Now, I'm obviously not 50 years old. I'm, I'm not even 30 years old. Um, and, but th there's a, a, a major difference between 50 years ago in the Christian church and the Christian church right now. 2017 marks the first time in Gallup's four-decade trend that biblical literism has not surpassed biblical skepticism. I have a hypothesis of, of why my generation has a hard time with believing the entire word of God. There are many Christians today that don't believe everything that is in the Bible is true. So 
If you disagree with me, this is just something for you to think about and to, to, to pray about. Please don't stone me. Normally, I, I don't preach on hypothesis, uh, on a hypothesis, but this one I felt strongly to do. And, and I believe um, that one of the leading reasons why Christians today struggle to believe the Bible for what it is is because of the lack of follow through with parenting. Let me explain. Say tonight, I promise Sam Lewis, I say, Sam Lewis, we're going to go to McDonald's and get ice cream tonight. He's fully aware of what McDonald's is, and he's fully aware of what ice cream is. How many else are fully aware of McDonald's soft serve delicious ice cream, right? Say I make him this promise, um, but someone ends up dying, and and I have to to make a hospital visit, or someone gets sick, or some emergency comes up, and and I break this promise that I made him. Now, most wouldn't see this as much of a problem at all, but to my son, his mind and and his heart would be confused because I had promised him that I would take him for ice cream. The next night, I tell Sam, I promise Sam that I always love you. But in his mind, he wonders, is this the type of promise that I received last night when I didn't get my ice cream? Or, Or maybe it looks like this. Imagine a family is over at a friend's house for dinner and one of their children does something naughty. And instead of dealing with the problem right then and there, the father or the mother um, you know, says something like this. When we get home, we're going to have a talk, and there will be a consequence for your actions. And did I ever hear those words growing up? <laughs> right? When we get home, we're going to have a talk. There will be a consequence. You're going to be in trouble when we get home. But the night gets late. The kids get home, and the mom and dad are already exhausted from a long day at work. And the fun evening... Um, just had them completely exhausted, so they opt to just put their children to bed because they're already past their bedtime, and they forget about their promised consequence. Now the next time the family is out, the kid misbehaves, thinking last time my parents uh, said they would discipline me, they didn't. They they must not really mean it. They start to roll the dice with the parenting and and, and, um, test the waters with their parenting. Now, I've been guilty of giving and receiving empty threats. I've been guilty of giving my word but not following through. And and I believe that because our homes, our schools, and our cultures seem to be more talk than follow through, we now have a generation that is rolling the dice with God. We have a generation that has a hard time believing the promises of God. And not just the doom and gloom promises of God that he's going to come back one day and and, uh, separate sheep and goat, but even the promises of, I'm for you, I love you, I will be with you, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Because we've had promises broken in our life and from our parents, maybe our children maybe our culture is struggling with believing and understanding the promises of Jesus Christ. Now hear me on this. The same way God has given us a consistent track record of his fulfilled promises so that we can have confidence that his future promises will come to pass, we also need to give our children and our grandchildren a consistent track record of our fulfilled promises made to them so that they not only know that we are good for our word, but they would also have no problem in believing God's word and God's promises. Will we fail at times? Absolutely. But do we need to do a better job? I think so. I believe that the more consistent we parent, the, easy it will, the easier it will be for our children to believe the promises of God. Now, I understand, um, you know, in preparing this, I, I feel convicted as a parent. And, and I understand um, that it might be, you might be sitting in your seat here tonight saying, man, I, I really dropped the ball. Or you might be questioning yourself um, because one of your children isn't serving the Lord or doesn't believe. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to bring guilt or condemnation. 
but I'm trying to, to bring about an awareness that our yes needs to be yes and our no needs to be no, and we need to follow through so that we can be a perfect, as close to perfect as an example of our Heavenly Father as we can while we're on this earth. So please don't feel guilty. Please don't feel condemned. Please don't feel like you've screwed it up. Um, you haven't. Just as Jesus died, just as he rose again, he definitely is coming again. How many believe that? You know why I believe that? Because his word never fails. It's been tested and proved. We have the track record of the Old Testament and all the prophecies both fulfilled outside of the Bible and within the Bible. And, and therefore, I have a hope that is secure, that is confident, where I can purify myself with it. And, and the Bible may sound far-fetched, but I believe it. My dad's Uncle Dewey, his favorite song was, Ain't No Grave Gonna Hold My Body Down. How many know that one? Yep, like four people. <laughs> Five. <laughs> okay. Ain't nobody gonna hold my body, or ain't no... Ain't, ain't no grave going to hold my body down. So tonight, um, I just want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. Know why you believe what you believe. And let your yes be yes and your no be no. In your parenting, I promise you, my dad, um, he was definitely not a, a perfect father. But one thing he never did was he never made a promise that he didn't fulfill. He said, that's the plan. We you promise you'll be at my baseball game? I'm pitching. It's the biggest game of my life, you know, or whatever. Well, that's the plan, Austin. I'm going to do everything that I can to be there, but I'm not going to promise you that. And at the time, I didn't understand it, but now I have an easy time believing in my heavenly Father promises because I could believe my Father's promises. As the musicians come, would you bow your head, close your eyes? God, I, I pray tonight that, that you'd give us faith to believe. That the crazy things of, of people popping up out of graves and being caught up in the air and, and you coming back and a trumpet out of nowhere, God, that, that we wouldn't just dismiss that as some I don't know, just out there philosophy, God, but we would, we would recognize it as truth. That, that we would look back at your fulfilled promises to build our faith, Jesus. I pray for the parents and the grandparents in here, God, that, that you would equip them to be people of their words, that, that we would um, just by your spirit and by your power become the best parents that we can, teaching our kids and raising our kids to believe in you, God. I pray that um, as, as times just, just become uncertain and there's just so many questions and, and things don't seem to add up, Lord, I just pray that, that us as Christians would stand on your hope, that we would understand that you are fully in control, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be be fearful, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be worried, we wouldn't be anxious about anything, but we would eagerly wait and, and, and just look forward to your return, God. Help build our faith tonight, Jesus.